It's a pleasure to be back with you today. I, uh, it's, it's, it's awesome that we're able to do this, even though we're not able to do it in person. I wish we were able to do it in person, but here we are nonetheless. So to God be the glory, right? I, I just want to encourage you as we get started today, um, you know, talking miracles yesterday and many of us desire and you've been praying and you're going, I just hadn't seen it yet. And I just want to encourage you right now just to keep praying for people. Because I'll tell you, I will, let me help you right here. I didn't always start seeing miracles. That's not how it always started for me. In fact, it was many people that I prayed for. Things didn't turn out the way that I thought they should have. And, you know, this, that, and the other. And then all of a sudden, there's a miracle. There's a manifestation. There's a, and you, you just keep pressing. You keep having faith and you keep operating in what you have. And, and Paul even talked about by reason of use. In other words, you keep using the giftings, the talents, the abilities that God has given you, and you operate in that and let God increase it over your life, okay? So just be faithful with what you've been given. Be operating in what you already have and go forward from there. Because I will tell you right now, it doesn't always start glamorous. When you graduate here, it, you may not get those stories that you're wanting. You may get a few here and there, but you may not be seeing what you want to see and People may lie to you. People may, you know, not support you like they said they would. And, and you get all these things that can be confusing. So here's the thing. Don't be confused about life and about what didn't happen. Keep seeking Jesus. Keep pressing, okay? Don't be concerned so much about the money side of it. Just be faithful. Keep trusting God, and God will bring the increase. Now, I, uh, I want to encourage you right here because... I am a little, I'm a little different than some of the people that you've been around or even heard from before in the fact that I, uh, I preach the gospel. And in, and in fact, just a couple of years ago, I kept up with it uh, one year. I had preached over 250-something times, and there was literally less than eight times in the whole year that somebody took up an offering for me. So let me say that again. I had preached over 250 200, I don't remember exactly, it was 250 something, 258 or something like that times that, that I had preached that year, had services, and literally there was under eight times. Uh, the year before it was five, the year before that it was three times that people had taken up an offering for me. And here's what I'm telling you I don't preach because of an offering, I preach because God called me to. Okay? Now, I don't work another job, this is what I do, I preach the gospel. Uh, I used to work construction years ago, and in 2003, my wife and I formed uh, Compelling Ministries, which is the ministry that we operate, and uh, when we formed Compelling Ministries, I was still working. I was working industrial construction, like some of us do, and, uh, you know, forming concrete, pouring concrete, laying asphalt, you know, some little bit of welding and fitting and so on and so forth, working shutdowns and I was preaching and uh, working, and then in 2004, I felt like God told me to step away, and I did, and been living what you would call by faith ever since then, and what I mean by that is I don't take up offerings per se, so I, in fact, I have, again, since June of 2000, I have not taken up an offering. I preach because God called me to, and I pray. My family and I, we pray, and we check the mailbox, and that is literally how we live. And I know many of you there are believing God and, you know, you've seen God do amazing things. So what I'm telling you right now is you take this time and you operate in faith. You do your portion. You work if you can work and you do what you, you can do. And then you believe God for the rest. And it didn't always start this way for me. I started believing for little things and started believing and believing and then it would grow and now I am, I, I've, I've got so much that we do every year, and I'm just so impressed with my God. But it didn't start that way. It started little by little and growing in it. So I want to encourage you today to take the faith that you have and to operate in it and to grow in it. And let God do the amazing in your life. Uh, you know, even <clears throat> leaving for the school bill uh, for out there for Judah and Lord willing, my daughter Abella will be there in, in August and, you know, we'll have two in school. And I don't know how in the natural things are going to happen, but I know this, I'm going to keep trusting God and the same God that has 
provided up today is the same God that will provide come, come August. So I, I have to walk this out just like you do. Okay, we're walking out things, we're walking out life, we're walking out, you know, uh, supporting schools and, and trying to build an orphanage and, and pastors and doing conferences and crusades and the massive amounts of money that are needed to do these crusades. In fact, in between us uh, recording yesterday's session and today, when I stopped, I had a message from a, a country in the Middle East asking me to, to preach there and to do and the amount of money that is needed to do these things only God can provide. So I just want to encourage you, keep believing, keep trusting God. You know, in the practical side of ministry, of walking it out, God has a plan. God's got a portion for you. He, he's got you. Just keep trusting Him. Keep Do your portion. If you can work and, you know, God, God's allowed you, you do that. And you work and you provide and you do your part and watch God be faithful with what He does. Uh... It says here in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, this is the one I quoted yesterday, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. He's able to do through you exceedingly abundantly above what you can ask or think. He is able to do it, but you've got to be willing to be used by him. And it says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 18, For not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. Okay, and I'm throwing this verse in here right here, not trying to take it out of context or anything, but I want you to hear this. It's not, it says, For not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. In other words, your stories and your your talk about yourself is not what's important. What's important is what God says about you. On that day, what I say about me is not important. What matters is what God says about me. What, what, what people's opinion of you will come and go. People's opinions of you can change. People can, can be downright mean and nasty toward us. But it's a matter. what matters is God's opinion about what you're doing. Some of us, we come from families where they may not appreciate our desire to follow Jesus. They may not appreciate our desire to, to uh, not be a doctor, not be a lawyer, not be a nurse, not be whatever. And you're, you're desiring to go to the mission field. You're desiring to pastor a church. You're desiring to work in children's ministry. And your family may not appreciate it. So what you're going to do is you're going to do the will of God because it's God who commends you and not a man. And if God calls you back to the workforce and calls you to be a doctor and lawyer, there's nothing wrong with that if that's the will of God over your life. So you do what God has called you to do, and you do it with excellence. Again, you do it as unto the Lord. And uh, like we said the last two days, you know, it's, it's, you can either do or you can sit on the sideline and have excuses. What are you going to do? You going to do for Jesus or are you going to sit and have excuses? So I, I want to pause right here, and I just want to... I, today I'm just giving it. I'm just giving wisdom. I, I am going to teach and preach some, but I want to speak from my heart to you. Uh, there are places that God's going to take you that if you don't prepare yourself now, you won't be able to do the things you desire to do when you get there. In other words, there are, there will be situations that will come up, even like right now. Many of you are desiring to go on the mission trips from CF and I coming in May. And wherever you're desiring to go, and let's just say that there's a worship team in that group, because I know many of the, the, the teams for years, they've had a worship team in the team. And if you play guitar, if you sing or whatever, then you can try out for the worship team in that group and, and try to make it. But here's the reality. If you desire to be on the team, but you can't play anything, you're not going to make it on the team. You can still go on the trip, but you're not going to be on that worship team. So what I'm saying is if you have a desire to lead somewhere or if God takes you to the middle of Africa somewhere and you can play the guitar, and I'm not saying you have to play skillfully like many on the platform that, that play in the mornings with, for the worship. But what I am saying is if you know the basic chords and the basics of, of the guitar or the keyboard, piano, or, or the bass, or whatever, you can use your talent, you can use your ability out there in the field. 
because there's a lot of churches, even in America, that are small churches that even that we go to to preach, and they don't have live worship. They use uh, what we call can worship, meaning they play a tape, they play a YouTube video or something, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but they just don't have the, the people, they don't have the talent to have live worship. So a lot of times when we go, we play you know, we do the worship and I do the preaching and so on and so forth, but that's all because we've learned how to play. I play the guitar, I play the keyboard some, I play the bass a little bit, I play a lot of things a little bit. I play enough to get by. And, and I'm, I'm about to grab my guitar here and we're going to, I'm gonna demonstrate something to you here and I hope it sounds okay, um, but I just wanna tell you, uh, as I get started, all the guitar players in the house may not like my, my style and my, my abilities here, but you know what? I don't play for, for you. I play unto the glory of God. Because here's, here's the reality. I have never had a lesson in my life. And this is what I want to say to help some of you. I have been playing for years, but I had a guy at church show me some chords. And there's people all across that campus that know how to play guitar. And if you don't know how to play, people can show you chords. You don't have to get an expensive guitar. I actually am got a uh, Martin D35 here, which is a nice guitar, but I didn't start that way. I started off of a guitar that my mom bought me out of a garage sale, and I still have it. It's a beater. It's a beat up old Yamaha classical guitar with a neck that wide that it was just terrible. But my point is, is that even right now, if you were in Africa and Kenya, there's a very good possibility that in the western part of Kenya, you're going to hear this song. And I'm going to sing it for you, and it's, my voice is a little fried, and I'm not concerned about that. What I want to demonstrate right here, and what I want to, to make known to you is, you can't do it if you don't know how, okay? And, and the Bible doesn't say it has to be a skillful noise. It just says make a joyful noise, and that's what I'm going to do. And then we'll talk about it, I'm going to play this real quick for you, okay? Waku wabudu Moko zi yesu Kando na wewe Apana mwingine Wewe peke yako I'm going to sing in English for you. We worship you, Almighty God, beside you. in Asia before and I've actually got a picture of this I was barefooted in Asia because a lot of times you take your feet your shoes off at the door and I'm sitting in the middle of an underground church with another beat up old guitar and I just started singing this because the word hallelujah in most languages is pretty much the same so if you know just some few basic chords You can sing and you can play and you can lead people into the presence of God. And I'll talk more about what I'm talking about in just a second. So if you know it, sing it with me. Hallelujah. 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 
time, Lord, I love you, Lord. I love you, yeah, yeah. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Yeah, and I live. my point is you do it for the glory of God you do it under the purposes of the kingdom of God and let God use you for his glory let the kingdom of God come through your mouth but you can't lead people if you don't know how okay so let me go a step further here and let me speak to the worship leaders for a moment I lead worship I've led worship all over the world I've even led in house of prayer in Italy and and all over you can't lead people somewhere you don't know how to go see there's one thing to play the chords there's one thing to play really skillfully it's another thing to be anointed and not everybody that sings and plays is anointed but see i've been in in services around the world where some of us that really skillfully play the guitar would laugh at the locals that are playing and how they're playing but when they start playing, the glory of God comes. Because it's not about the skillfulness of their playing. It's about the anointing of God that they spent time in the presence of God. And see, and I've been in, in churches around and, and in places where they have some really good skillful players. And I, I've even been back to the campus at times over the years and there were skillful players, but they weren't anointed in their playing. And I would have told them to sit down. Because I would rather somebody play G, C, and D all day and play in the anointing of God than to be able to walk the scales and to play skillfully and don't even know what the anointing of God is, wouldn't know it if it walked in the room. So I'm challenging you, all of you in the worship and all of you that are headed in that area and all of you wanting to lead, get to know the presence of God more than your skillful playing. And I understand you're going to get upset at me and all that because I don't hold my pick just right and I don't do this just right and I don't hold the angle of my guitar just right. But you know what? When I start playing like that in certain places and in, in around the world, don't be surprised if blinded eyes start opening. Don't be surprised if the lame people don't start up get up walking because it's not about my skillfulness. Yes, if you can learn to play skillfully, play skillfully, absolutely. Play it, do it, learn it. But don't forget about the anointing. Learn the anointing of God. Get in the presence of God. Because again, I tell you, you can't lead people somewhere you don't know where to go yourself. That's why we have so many worship platforms today that seem to be powerless in their leading. And, and we have to do all this extras in our worship because we don't even know what the anointing is. We have to try to facilitate it and try to to get all the skillfulness to do and to try to facilitate the presence of God. It's not that way in the reality. And again, there's nothing wrong with being skillful. And there's nothing wrong with having a, an amazing worship team. But it is something wrong when that amazing worship team wouldn't know the anointing of God if it hit them upside the head. And many times we think we do, but I'm telling you, you better get in the presence of God. That's where the anointing of worship comes from. That's where songwriting, you don't go in there just to write a song and say, we're going to write songs today. No, you got to get in the presence of God because God's going to give the songs to the songwriters if they'll get in his presence because it's coming from the throne of God. Just like a sermon. Let me get to the preachers right here. Don't ever be guilty of reading the Bible to get a sermon. Don't ever be guilty of going in, okay, I'm going to get a sermon now. No, sir. 
What you do is you go in there and you start worshiping God and you seeking God and God will start speaking to you. But listen, you better understand something right here. Not everything that God tells you is for everybody else. Sometimes God is speaking to you as an individual. And what you've got to do is learn the difference between God speaking to you and correcting you and then God bringing you something for the people. So we've got to discern and we've got to use the abilities and talents that God has given us. But it all comes out of the anointing of God. I'm telling you, student, you learn and you do, but you got to get in the presence of God. You got to learn to abide in the presence. There's, there comes a time when it's not about life as much as it is the presence of God. And I'm challenging you today. Get in the presence of God. Get in the presence of God. Get in the presence of God. Your life comes out of the presence of God. You want to go far in the things of ministry? You want to go far in the things of life and business? It's got to come out of the presence of God. You got to learn to abide in that presence under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. He is my fortress. And I, God, in Him do I trust. So let's get on to what we came to, to speak about today. Uh, Psalm chapter 101, Psalm 101, look at verse 1, 2, and 3. It says, verse 1 says, I will sing of the mercy and justice to you. O Lord, I will sing praises. I will behave wisely in a perfect way. O when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. The last part of verse 2, I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Verse 3. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I will hate, I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. Verse 4, a perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. Did y'all catch that? Look at the end of verse 2 again. I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Verse 3, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. Verse 4, a perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. What I came to, to, to talk to you and to, to challenge you with today is some of us, we've got offenses in our life. We've got things of our past that you've got to let go of. And what you've got to do is you've got a purpose in your heart. You've got to set a line in your heart where it says right, right here, it will cling to me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. And see, I remember I was on campus there back in November or so, and, and I made the comment about Pokemon and this, that, and the other, and some of your precious little witchcraft movies, and y'all got all offended at me, some of you, and some of you was excited about it, but you got offended at me. Look, here's the thing. Don't get offended at me. Let's get to the Word of God. And the Word of God says, I won't set anything wicked before me. I will not know wickedness. A perverse heart shall depart from me. It's, verse 3 says, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. What I'm challenging you today, see, so many of us, we've got these, these things right here. I've got a little phone in my hand, and this happens to be a little Samsung, and some of you've got iPhones, and you've got your tablets, and you've got your computers, and all, that thing, all those things can be wonderful, and I use most of those. I do. But if I'm not careful, this thing right here will use me. And see, right here at my fingertips, if I'm not careful, can lead me into sin. Through some of my uh, social uh, platforms, if I'm not careful, I can slide my finger one direction or another, and I can type in a word or two here, and it will pull up anything I want to look at and lead me straight into sin. And if I'm not careful, I'll allow my finger and my eyes to lead me into sin. And what we've got to do today is we've got to make a covenant with ourselves, not before anybody else, but before ourselves. What we've got to do is set a purpose in our heart that I will not allow wickedness to come before my eyes. Because if we're honest, the enemy is trying to take us out. The enemy is trying to, to as, as one uh, rapper singer says, you can take a can of gasoline and light it all over your self-esteem. In other words, everything's out there trying to burn you up. It's trying to, it's trying to take you out. It is, trying to, it is trying to destroy you. You can take that gasoline and pour it all over your self-esteem. In other words, 
it's going to ignite on you if you're not careful. See, what we've got to do is, the Bible says right here, I will set before my eyes no vile thing. You've got a purpose in your heart, I'm not going to be offended. Because what is love? It takes no offense. It does not keep a record of wrongs. It, it doesn't keep a record of, you offended me, you hurt me, I'm upset at you. Okay? What you've got to do and what I have to do every day is I have to forgive and I have to release people. It's, it's so easy to take up offenses. It's so easy to allow things to penetrate my heart. It's so easy to get sidetracked in ministry and in life, in my home, in my marriage, in being a, a dad to my children, in being a preacher, a pastor, and going on mission trips, in doing. It's so easy to get sidetracked. It's so easy to allow things to come into my heart to divert me from the purposes of God. But the psalmist says right here, I will set before my eyes no vile things. See, if God doesn't just want you to read his word or to be able to quote his word, he wants you to experience him. That's why I keep coming back to his presence. It's not about how much I can quote. Yes, the Bible does say, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. But it's the walking it out that's more important. It's, it's, the, it's the walking day to day of setting myself, I'm not going to defile myself. I am not going to lead myself into sin. I'm not going to help the enemy out in taking me down. I'm, see, there's things in your heart that God's been dealing with you about. There's things that he's been penetrating on you and dealing with you. Stop fighting him and give it in. Give up, give up those things. If there's, there's areas, if some of us social media, we need to turn it off because it's become a God to us. It's become, it's, it's got us in its clutches. It's, it's tangled a web around us and we don't even know how to exist without it. We don't know how to exist without our phones anymore. And it's wrong. My life does not come from my phone. My life comes from the presence of God. You and I must purpose in ourselves that we'll get back to the foundation of what's really, what's really real, what's really true. What is my purpose? What is my destiny? Where it, where, it's all found in the presence of God. Because again, God doesn't just want you to read His Word. He wants you to experience Him. He wants you to taste and see that He really is good. He wants you to abide in His presence. He wants what you're doing to come out of His presence. It says, or I'm, I'm saying... Uh, God doesn't just want you to read. He wants you to experience, okay? If all you do is come to the school, if all you do is come to Christ for the nations, now we're doing it online, but if all you do is learn, but you never learn to experience the presence of God for yourself, then I'm going to tell you, the school has failed you. Because it's not about coming into the presence of God. It's about learning how to come into the presence of God on your own. Life is not about all these other things. It's about knowing God. At the end of it all. See, when the sheep were separated from the goats and all that, in the, in the Word of God, when it talks about it, did you know Him? Depart from me, you work of iniquity, I never knew you. It didn't say you went to Christ for the nations. It said, I didn't know you. It didn't say you didn't know how to do miracles. It didn't say you didn't know how to lead somebody to Jesus. It says, I didn't know you. And I'm telling you right now, the most important thing in your life needs to be knowing Jesus. The most important thing in my life is needs to be knowing Jesus. He's got to be the number one thing in my life. He's got to be the, the all-inclusive is in the presence of God. Direction, insight, revelation, wisdom, all comes from Him. Whatever you're needing, Whatever your direction you're needing over your life, I'm telling you where to find it. You've been asking pastors, you've been asking your deans, you've been asking this person, that person for wisdom, what do I need to do? And it's good to ask for wisdom. But let me tell you where your answer needs to come from. Your answer needs to come from the presence of God. And when you get in the presence of God, he will answer you and then he'll send the, send the dean or an RA or somebody to come and they'll tell you something that will line up with what God has already spoken as a confirmation to what God said. 
God will confirm his word. He will confirm what he's saying over you and to you, but you must first be in his presence. You got to be listening. You got to encounter God. And that's not just something we have on a Friday night called an encounter weekend. It's something that you do every day, encountering God by yourself. Get alone in the presence of God. If we would pursue him the way we pursue other relationships, many of our lives would forever change. But I'm just amazed at how many of us, we spend so much time pursuing earthly relationships and we forget about the one relationship that matters the most, and that's the presence of God. you got to learn how to be and abide in His presence. And it all starts by going, God, here am I. I really don't know what I'm doing sometimes. But God, I'm here, and I want to be used by you, and I surrender myself afresh and anew to you today. I give myself to you, and I love you, Jesus. It, it starts that simple. That's pretty much how I start my mornings. Good morning, presence of God, I love you. And I surrender myself to you today. I give myself to you and I love you, God. And I just want to speak it out of my mouth that I love you. Come on, could you say that with me right now? God, I love you. God, I love you. And let it come from deep down inside of you. God, I love you. And there's nothing in my life that matters more to me than you. There's nothing. It's not my vehicle. It's not my family, not my job, not my relationship. You, Jesus, are the number one thing in my life. Because I'm telling you, at this school or right now online, the number one thing is not just being in his presence. It's you learning how to be in his presence. It's learning to live from that presence. It's learning to abide out of that presence. No matter what I'm doing, I can stay in his presence. I can stay. Judah and I, just, just a couple of days ago, we were planting the corn and driving tractors. I'm out there, and he's over there on one tractor, and I'm on another tractor. I'm planting, and he's disking, and, and we're just out there, and I'm watching him, and he's concentrating, but I can tell he's worshiping God. He's doing his thing, and I'm on my tractor, and I'm worshiping God. My dad's out there, and he's worshiping God because that's we learning to abide and, and do life out of the presence of God. It says, uh, Hebrews chapter 8, I want to read real quick, Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews 8 verse 10 says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and, and none of his brothers, saying, Know the Lord, for he all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. Okay, I'm going to read verse 10 again. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Look, when you come to Jesus and you give your life to Jesus, it's not just a verse it's not just a declaration, it's the reality. You belong to him. When you were baptized, you went down an old man, you came up with something, a new creation, old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. You're no longer your own. You don't get to do what you want to do anymore. And if you, do, if you keep doing what you desire to do, then you don't belong to him. You are his servant. You belong to God to do what he desires, whatever that is. And I'm not telling you what it is. I'm just telling you, you've got to do what the Lordship of heaven says you have to do. Because many of us, we desire to be saved without having a Lord, and it doesn't work that way. He's got to be your Lord and Master and your Savior. See, when it comes, when it comes to, we've got to fully surrender. But don't be like Esau. Esau traded off his lifelong blessing his lifelong gift to satisfy a short-term appetite. Don't sell out for something simple. Give yourself over to Jesus and don't be sidetracked. Don't let a man or a woman, don't let a job situation keep you from fulfilling what God's called you to do. Some of us, even right now, some of us, you have relationships that you need to let go of. Some of us, we have friends that we need to cut out of our life because it's not healthy and it's not leading us to Jesus. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to give you a piece of wisdom right here, a piece of advice, that if that, that individual, if you're seeking a husband or a wife and you're not married and you're seeking one and you think you found that, that man or that woman that's, that will be your husband or wife, 
If they're not leading you to God, if they're not challenging you to be more like Jesus, if they're not leading you to the presence of God, I'm going to tell you right now, you don't need them. You need somebody that's going to challenge you, somebody that's going to help you seek and press in on the things of God. You need someone that's like-minded of you and the things of God. If you've got a desire for missions, then you need to find someone that has missions in their heart. Don't get sidetracked. If you've got a desire to go and, and give it all and go live off the grid and see, see people saved, healed, and delivered, and, and you've got a, something great, go find that person that God has for you and let God lead you to them, somebody like-minded that will help you do the calling and bidding of heaven. My wife and I, we are one. We've come together. We are one. And we help each other in the calling of God and what God has over our lives. Without her, I'm not complete in the sense that she helps me and I help her and we become one and we go forward in doing the things of God. So my wife tells me all the time, this is what she tells me. She says, I don't care what we do as long as you tell me it was God. Just tell me that God is leading us and it lines up with what she's hearing and we come together and we focus and we go forward. But see, we have done something in our lives. We set a line in our lives and we're not going to cross it. Because see, I know in the time we live and, you know, everybody's saying, well, not everybody has the same standards when it comes to movies and music and all these other things, okay? And I'm not going to draw that line for you. I know where I've drawn that line. But I'm not going to draw that line for you. But this is what I will tell you. If it doesn't line up with the Word of God, and if it doesn't bring you closer to Jesus, then do you really need it in your life? If it's just entertainment, do you really need it in your life? What is that entertainment doing in your life? Is it just a distraction? Or is it filling a void that God's trying to fill, but we haven't learned how to let the presence of God fill that void? See, you, you want to talk about, well, I can do this and I have the freedom to do that. And you can. It's, it's your body. It's your life. It's your, your thing. Everybody wants to talk about a hot topic right now, tattoos. Can I do it? Can I not do it? And I'm not going to tell you what you can or can't do. But I will tell you this. Whatever you do, you better hear the Spirit of God on the matter. Because there are people out there that if you try to go preach to them, their only question is, when did you get that tattoo? And, and again, I'm not telling you what you can or can't do. Follow the leading of the Spirit of God on the matter. But I'm saying for me, there are people that I'm, I'm reaching, there's tribes and there's people groups that if I show up with a fresh tattoo, they're not going to listen to me because in their culture, it's wrong. There's certain things that their culture is wrong, so I'm not doing it because I'm not offending them because I want to reach them. It's just like eating the food of the, of the culture. I'm going to eat whatever they set in front of me, first of all, because Jesus said to. Second reason is I'm not offending them. I'm going to do my level best to not offend that culture so I can reach people for Jesus because that's what I purposed in my life. There's a lot of things that I can do that I'm not going to do because it affects other people. Okay? So here's the thing. you got to draw a line. So when it comes to watching things, when it comes to music, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to whatever, are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? That's a line you have to draw, and it's a standard that you've got to figure out. And here's how you do it. Not by world standards and not by church standards, but by the Spirit of God standards. You take the Word of God, and you figure out what you believe and why you believe it, and you stand on it. If tattoos is good for you, if listening to worldly music is good for you, then you've got to stand before God for it. Okay? Whatever it is, and, I, and again, I'm not trying to draw attention to tattoos. I'm just saying whatever it is, that's just a hot topic in our culture right now. Whatever it may be, hear from heaven before you act on it. Hear from heaven before you do it. When you're, you're learning and doing, hear from heaven in whatever you're doing. Do it, do it to, as unto God. Do it as unto God. I have friends that, that they're doing things that I'm not doing, and that's okay. That's between them and God. I'm not their judge, neither are you. But each one of us will stand before God and we will give account for what we've done. That is reality. That is the word of God. So what I'm challenging you today is find your standard and hold it. When it comes to relationships, I told you the other day that I had not, I've never kissed anyone besides my wife because that's a, that's a line I chose to pick and choose and I chose to hold that. I'm not saying that that's right or wrong. I'm, not, I'm just saying it's what I did because I made a standard and I held to it. 
I made a standard and I held. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to draw lines and you're going to have to hold that line even if it offends other people because that's between you and God. So whatever your standard is, let it be as unto the Lord. Come on, let, let, let the Spirit of God help you and lead you in drawing those standards because if you don't draw those standards, if you don't draw those lines, if you don't make a covenant with yourself, the enemy will come in and destroy you if you're not careful. Look, I want to flip over to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. And it says over here in Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies nor with the wine with which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. I want to focus on this part. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. That's what we're going to talk about just for a few moments. He purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself before his God. Now what you've got to do is you've got to figure out in your life, I'm not doing this in your life. I'm going to make an agreement with myself. I'm going to make it a covenant with myself. I will not allow my eyes to look at this anymore. I will not allow my finger to take me over here anymore. I will not drive myself over there anymore. I will not do that. I'm making an agreement with myself that if I continue down this road, it's leading me into sin. And God is trying to call us out of certain things to bring purity to us, to bring the standard of righteousness, to bring holiness, to bring about change in our life. But we've got to be willing to let go of things in order to grow and to change. I cannot grow if I continue to hold on to what I've been holding on to. I've got to forgive, I've got to release, I've got to set my boundaries, and I've got to set my lines, and I'm going to purpose in my heart, and I'm going to make an agreement with my eyes, with my hands, my feet, my mouth, my ears. I will not defile myself before God. So again, I'm not telling you what you can or cannot listen to. But I know this, if we call ourselves people of God, if we call ourselves by the name of God, if we call ourselves Christians, then some of us need to change what we've been listening to. Some of us need to be changing what we've been watching, what our mouth has been saying, what our ears have been hearing, where our finger has been taking us. Some of us, we need to be changing to be conformed to the image of Jesus. And as we finish here, I want to tell you in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, Therefore, come out from among them, be ye separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Verse 18, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord, Lord Almighty. Verse, chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We've got to come out from the world standards and get in the biblical standards. And I'll tell you, there are certain things that my flesh would love to do, that would love to do, but I'm not going to do it because it offends the Spirit of God. I am more concerned about offending God than I am pleasing the world. I am more concerned about my God than I am my friend's opinion of me. There's a lot of people that don't like me, and they tell me, well, you just have different standards than I have, and you just, you just this, that, and the other. And I will tell you right now, friend, each one of us are going to stand before God and give account. And what you do in your body, what you do with your life, it matters. You are going to give account for what you do, what you listen to, what you watch, what you, what you take a part of, what you get involved with. You better be careful, my friend. Eternity's coming, and it's coming swiftly. And each one of us are going to stand before God and give account. And we can, we can be a part of a Bible school, and we can have darkness hit in our heart if we're not careful. I'm asking you to check yourself today. Make sure you're still in the faith. I'm asking you to check yourself to make sure righteousness and holiness and the purity of God is still the number one thing in your life. Or have we been dulled down by the standards of the world? Have we allowed our background? Have we allowed people in our family? Have we allowed other people to dull down the things of God? I'm challenging you today to make the number one thing the number one thing in your life. The presence of God. If there's things in your heart that God has been convicting you about, then repent of it, cut it out, and let's go forward. 
Again, if there's relationships, if there's, there's areas and people in your life that, that's just not, and you know it's not right, and you know God's dealing with you, then cut it out, release that thing, and go forward. Some of us, we need to, we need to, to, to let those things that have been weighing us down, as the Word says, those hindrances which have been besetting us, let it go, repent of it, and cut it out of your life, and let's go forward. Let's go on into the things and the purposes of God. Stop, stop allowing excuses to hold you down. I've been saying this for all three days. You can make a move or you can live in excuses. You can make excuses or you can make a move. What are you going to do? There's watching and then there's doing. What are you going to do? I'm challenging you like Daniel, who purposed in his heart not to defile himself. And to do like the psalmist said, I will set before my eyes no vile thing. I'm asking you today to make a covenant with yourself, with your eyes, with your purpose over your life, because the destinies of God are there, the purposes of God are there, the anointing of God is there, but you have to decide. I'm going with the things of God, or I'm going to allow the things of the world to pull me down. Don't be a nominal Christian in the sense of, I just go to church and I'm going to do my little bit hoping to make it. This is not a hoping issue. This is a life and death eternity issue. Give it all for Jesus. Give it all for Jesus. What does, it, what does this world have to offer you that's worth going to hell over? What's this world even have to offer that's worth not doing the will of God over? What's this world got to offer you that's not worth giving it all for Jesus over? Wherever God takes you and whatever, wherever he leads you, May you do it mightily unto the presence of God. Friend, I believe in you. And I know some of you is probably offended at me right now. And that's okay. Because here's the thing. You will not stand before God and accuse me of not telling the truth. I'm going to speak the truth to you. You may not like me. Because here's the reality. I'm having to walk this out just like you are. The reality is, is I'm having to walk this thing called life out just like you. And all of us that are Bible school students and all of us that are wanting to teach this, you know, when we teach the Word of God, the Bible says we'll be held to a higher standard. So make sure what you're doing is as unto God and the glory of God. And make sure what you're doing brings honor and glory to the name of Jesus. Because I believe in you. This school believes in you. These teachers believe in you. And even more than that, God believes in you. There's purpose. There's destiny. But first, let's draw a line. And let's say, I will not defile myself before my God. I will not allow my eyes to defile me. I will not allow my ears nor my feet, my hands, my mouth. I will set myself aside for the purposes of God. So in the days ahead, no matter what this world happens, no matter what, what's coming at us, I don't know those things, but I know this, that through my God we shall do valiantly, and that it is He that will tread down our enemy. So let today be the purposes of God. May they be made manifest in your life. So I'm going to ask that the Lord of glory watch over you. May the protection of the presence of God overshadow and be around you in a mighty manner. In all of your goings and doings, may it be unto the glory of God and the presence of God. May the Lord watch over you and protect you and keep you safe. May you go in the grace and the favor of God and the fellowship of the Spirit of God. And may the counsel of heaven be yours and in abundance. May the wisdom of heaven be mightily upon your lives. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Jesus is king and the devil is a liar. Thank you for listening these last three days. May you be blessed in Jesus' name. Jesus' name.